Hey, this is Mossy. Okay, this is actually the third attempt in recording slash re restreaming this video uh, because, um, well, in the first take, I tried to explain. But that's the first take, and you're not gonna see that part, so. Uh, in short, I will be replaying Rod's end route. Um, due to some small demand on YouTube and Twitter. And also, um, I need to warn you that my reactions won't be as genuine as the first time I played it because uh, I've already, I already know what's going to happen. And so I'll just be like, I won't fake it because that's probably not fun to watch at all. And you'll be like, oh, that's that's a fake reaction. Why would you do that? That's so fake. Yeah, I, I won't be reacting as wildly as I did in my first attempt. I really wish that uh, OBS didn't freeze the footage. Um, it also froze the audio, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, if I still had the audio, I'd overlay it with uh the gameplay but i don't sorry so yes i'll be replaying this part in short okay here we go uh the throne room is empty when i arrive i can only hope that this is not some sort of trap oh also i'll be not i'll no longer be playing the, the original game audio because it has some copyright issues on YouTube and it will just put up an ad. So um, if you don't know, I don't put ads on videos. I don't monetize any of the videos. I might do in the future once I get like a larger following, but for now, um, I just, it's like a video archive. So I try, try not to put any ads. Um, but if you do see any ads on the videos, it is mainly due to uh, any existing copyright claims on the video itself. Uh, largely due to either the music used, the gameplay used, or any other like smaller issue. Okay, that's all done. I'm done explaining. I really hope I don't have to start explaining again. Because that's the third time I explained the video, talking to myself on this. Uh, okay, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. Soon after I enter the door, soon after I enter, the door squeaks open and a familiar face enters the room. S Sir Mithros? Sir Mithros walks towards me. When he's close enough, he drops to one knee and bows. I frown as I take a step back from him. My princess, do not be alarmed. I know of your true identity. Sir Mithros flashes me a wide smile that causes a shudder to run down my spine. You know who I am, then that means you are... I take another step back as the blood drains from my face. Sir Mithros' smile only widens at my reaction. I'll say it for you. Yes, I am a witch. If you're a witch, then Sir Alcaster is... A he mere human. A foolish one. And Vard? Nothing but my personal errand, boy. A thought suddenly occurs to me. If Sir Alcaster was plotting against the kingdom, then did Sir Mithros also punish Fritz somehow? What about Fritz? Was he a part of Sir Alcaster's plans? Ah, the knight. To avoid confusing you, let us just say that the situation surrounding him is too complicated to adequately explain. I command you to answer my question, Sir Mithros. Was Fritz, was Fritz a part of this? If it makes you feel any better, he refused to be part of this. He refused? Does that mean he was not a part of the plans? Or just that he is an unwillingly forced to participate in them? I'm sure that 
I'm certain that Sir Alcaster would not be happy that his own son was disobeying him. He either forced him to help or assigned him outside of the palace. But if Sir if Fritz knew of Sir Alcaster's plan, why did he not warn anyone about them? Was he working with Sir Mithros as well? No more, more questions swirl in my mind, but none of them have answers. When this is over, I will personally ask Fritz about this. Once I can locate him. I shake the thoughts away and bring my attention back to Sir Mithros. Why bother with this reveal? What do you hope to gain from it? Before we start our conversation, Sir Mithros waves his hand, conjuring a faint green glow that envelops the whole room. <clears throat> Just in case someone decides to eavesdrop, I wouldn't want any of your witch friends listening on, on us. Yes, I am aware that one of them has been snooping around the palace these fat past few months. Their snooping has made it more difficult to move around without exposing myself. Sir Mithros clicks his tongue in annoyance. Such a nuisance. He's referring to Delora. She and Parfait warned me that there was a witch in the palace. Is Sir Mithros truly that witch? Uh, yes, he's that witch. I never really trusted him, not even when the, I was a princess. Now that he has revealed himself as a witch, I need to know what he plans on doing. You knew that I was the princess this entire time, yet you never offered me any assistance. If I had, Alcaster would have targeted you, you as well. What? Alcaster wanted to dispose of the royal family. If he had known you were the princess, he would have been after you as well. It would have been easier with no one remembering you as the princess. But unfortunately, Fritz told his father about you, thinking that Alcaster might be able to help and protect you. And it didn't help that Varg confirmed it. Your mother wouldn't have been happy with me if I had put you in harm's way. That is why I had to protect that that is why I had to pretend not to know you in order to protect you. Sir Mithros is silent for a few moments before he speaks again. Revealing myself to be a witch was necessary. I had to make myself appear useful to Alcaster somehow, after all. Then of course I learned of his foolish plans to steal the crown and decided to thwart them, though not before I stole something from Alcaster first. I played him like the fool he was. I told him I would aid him with my magic so long as he gave the knight's protection. Using magic is almost impossible in this place, so having the knights to back me up was crucial. The knights? What does he make the knight's protection for? What are his plans? Sir Mithros pa starts pacing the room, his expression still calm. I found that he planned to dispose of me after he tamed what he needed, so I disposed of him first. Alcaster might have been able to convince most of the knights to aid him by promising them promotions, but... Well, my magic is far more convincing. Sir Mithros stops in front of me, his deadpan expression transforming into a smile. For now... Uh, excuse me. For now, let us desist speaking of my plans. The moment Alcaster's plans were thwarted, I knew I had to contact you directly. I am happy to see you in the palace, your highness. Although, we really need to get you out of those clothes soon. A maid's clothing does not befit a princess like yourself. That doesn't matter. My priority right now is to break my curse. Ah, of course. They must truly have been frightened to feel the need to curse you. I feel an uncomfortable tug in my heart to think that the loose despair would actually allow a witch to curse you. Sir Mithros shakes his head, disgust written on his features. When you suddenly vanished that night, it was as if all traces of your existence has vanished. I searched for your endless sweet princess. When you first appeared here in the palace, I did not recognize you immediately, but I felt a touch of magic in you and investigated. My curiosity is what prompted me to investigate you further. 
When I tried hard enough, I found that I could see through the glamour that had been cast on you. So, Sir Nathros truly was the witch Parfait was referring to when she mentioned something seen through the glamour. Yes, he's a witch. Is it really that hard to wrap your head around? Like, he's even cast the green spell. <sighs> Imagine my surprise when I found out that it was actually you. That fairy bearer has been nothing but a nuisance to us witches. First, she betrayed your mother, then she betrayed you before she had even met you. But mother, she was the TB bear corrupted by darkness. Parfait only did what she had to. Sir Mithros looks at me clearly surprised. What lies have those people been whispering in your ear? Everything the queen did, she did for us witches, to protect us from the wicked humans who destroyed our kind. It is clear to me where Sir Mithros' alliances lie. Sir Mithros sighs, runs a hand through his hair, then continues speaking. On your 18th birthday, you will follow her footsteps. You will make this kingdom a place for all witches to prosper. I am nothing like her. I refuse to make people suffer to fuel the crystal. I never bore witness to the suffering the people had to go through during my mother's reign, but the stories are enough to reveal her true nature to me. It was hard to believe at first that those people do not have any reason to lie to a servant like myself. They have nothing to gain from it. I fall in love. Your mother wouldn't be happy to hear you say that. Let me assure you that this is not a destiny you can run from, dear princess. I will not let destiny take control of my life. I feign ignorance, uh, I feign tiredness by releasing a long yawn. I am sorry for cutting you short, Sir Mithros, but please excuse me, I am very tired. I am about to walk past Sir Mithros when he starts speaking again. His voice a low whisper. I notice you have gotten closer to the family you so despised before, the prince included. I narrow my eyes at him. You care about him, don't you? I must confess that this surprises me, princess. Such a relationship cer would certainly be a scandal. Even if you two are not blood related, he is still your stepbrother. Whatever will your dear father say about this? I clench my fists. He has no right to lecture me. I already know that these feelings are wrong. I know that I cannot have them. I assure you that there is nothing between the both of us. Oh, is that so? Are those lies you uttered just to convince yourself? This man is beginning to try my patience. Hmm. Allow me to share a little secret with you, princess. I'm not interested. I head for the door to reach for and reach for the knob. Oh, but I think that it is something you would be most curious about. I do, after all, know the consequences of the prince failing to break his curse. I also know. I also happen to know that someone special to him is getting married tomorrow. My hand freezes. How do you know about all of this? I know all of the happenings around this place. That is my job, princess. Now tell me, do you know the ending to the fairy tale of the Little Mermaid? My blood runs cold when I remember what Emmeline told me about that fairy tale. If the prince fell in love and married someone else, the Little Mermaid's heart would break and she would dissolve into sea foam. I conducted my own investigation and actually met the witch who bestowed the curse on the prince. In meeting her, I found out everything that there is to know about it. I turned to regard Mithros with a frown. Ah, it seems I finally got your attention. What do you plan on doing, Turod? Sir Mithros shrugs. To him? Nothing really, I was merely curious. I wanted to know what you saw in him. What do you know about his curse? 
stays true to the fairy tale, only in this case, the prince gives up his voice for a title. Still, it will end the same way. The girl will fall in love with someone else despite his sacrifice. You mean? On his beloved wedding day, the prince will die. I had thought you might have reached the same conclusion. Tragic, don't you think? I had the same thought, but is Rod truly going to die? So the reason Rod gave up his breaking his curse was because he knew that Fiorico would never love him back. He knew that he was going to die the moment Fiorico married. Dread begins to wash over me. Why not ask him yourself? As if orchestrated by magic, the double doors open and Rod steps inside. When he sees me, his expression relaxes. I've been looking all over for you. I wanted to speak with you about my discussion with Lady Marfay. I turn around to face Sir Mithros once again, but to my surprise, he is already gone. When did, when did Sir Mithros leave? Lisette, is something wrong? Was Sir Mithros really speaking the truth? I think I confronted him. Is this how you really want things to end? What are you talking about? Have you ever thought about your family or feel after they find out that you lied about your curse? You're going to die when Viorka gets married tomorrow, am I right? That is why you told me that there is nothing I could do to help you break your curse. Because there's really nothing you could do to help me. Viorka will never return my love. I've already accepted my fate a long time ago. Lady Parfait was the one who insisted I find another way to break my curse. Because she refuses to give up on you, and I won't give up on you either. <sighs> I've been away of another. I've been aware of another way to break my curse from the beginning, but I would rather die than to do what is needed to do. Do what? Have you not read? Rod's voice trails off when he sees my confused expression. He clears his throat. Forget it. There is nothing more you can do. The reason I never told anyone the truth of my curse is because I never wanted anyone to blame themselves for not being able to help me. I already, I was already a lost cause the moment Bjorkov really fell in love with someone else. I could never take that happiness away from her. Rod becomes silent, his gaze downcast. The vulnerable expression cut catches me by surprise. You should have told me about your curse a long time ago. How many times must I repeat myself? Telling you about my curse won't change the outcome. I already tried to help you. I could have tried to help you, I mean. Why are you so insistent on helping me? Because I care about you. Oh. My face warms up when the words escape my lips. Rod also flushes. But what are you saying? That I'm worried about you on Emily's behalf, of course. I don't want her to think that I let you die. Rod lets out a deep sigh. Sigh. Just stop talking. You know you're in no position to tell me what to do. Is that? There's a hint of warning in his voice. You better not. Now you better let me help you, or. My words are cut off when Rod presses his lips to mine. It is only a brief kiss when he pulls away. His usual somberness has returned. I told you to stop talking. I can only stare back at him baffled. Rod, you do realize that you just kissed the princess. Rod looks at Sebi then at me. His face colors once more. He takes a step back, his lips pressed together. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Without any other warning, Rod turns abruptly and stalks out of the room. Sebi falls from his shoulder and falls to the ground, but Rod does not notice in his hurry to leave. I stare after him in shock. Can't believe he's just... I can't believe he just ran away! I walk to where Sebi is and kneel down to pick him up.
Are you all right? I'm fine, Prince. I'm fine. Thank you, Princess. Sebi tilts his head to the side. That rod. I wonder when he will start acting like a man. Suddenly kissing a girl like that is so unromantic. I think about the warmth of Rod's lips pressed against mine and flush again. Rod may not say much, but he's got a lot going on in his head. Thoughts he doesn't want anyone to know. I don't want to speak on his behalf, but I know he really does care about you, princess. He's just a little standoffish and has a difficult time showing his emotions. He's sensitive like that. Take it from me, I'm always in his head. I care about him too, but what will become of my feelings once I break his curse? Or my curse? I will return to his stepsister when this is all over. Oh wait, I read that wrong. I will return to becoming his, being his stepsister when this is all over. No, this is not the time to mull over such thoughts. I'm sorry of, for asking this of you, princess, but can you return me to Rod? That Bowie is useless without me. The exasperation in Sebi's voice makes me smile. Sebi acts like Rod's over solving. Of course. When Rod does not open the door, I knock again. Rod's eyes widen as soon as he sees me. His face flushes a dark crimson. Um, I'm here to return Sebi. Rod nods before slowly taking Sebi from my hands. They, they, thank you. Be careful not to drop me again next time. There is a hint of a smile on Rod's face as he taps Sebi's face. Sorry. He looks so much more at ease when he smiles. Rod faces me again with an apologetic expression. Lucette, I really am sorry for what I did earlier. I know you did not intend to do that in the first place. But the truth is, I actually... He trails off and averts his eyes slowly to the floor. Suffice it to say, I'm not supp supposed to feel this way about you. What exactly are you feeling? Rod flushes deep red before turning away. Don't ask me such a embarrassing question. The hovering silence becomes more pronounced as we both stop talking. You said you wanted to talk to me about something you discussed with Lady Parfait? Yes. I bet to tell you that Dolora will be here tomorrow to investigate. Now that we know Sir Alcaster is not the witch, we have to start our investigations over. Actually, about that, I know who the witch is. What the fuck? You do? It's Sir Mithros. He's the real witch. Sir Mithros? So when Sir Alcaster was throwing around accusations last night, they were true. Sir Mithros is already aware that Delora has been investigating the palace. We need to warn her. Then I will send Lady Parfait a quick message. We need to keep our guard around him too, especially you. I'm sure he already knows that you're the crowned princess. I nod in response. For now, we should wait for Delora to show up tomorrow. It's getting late. You should go and get some rest. The moment he says the words, I realize he is correct. My eyelids are heavy. You're right. I think I shall take my leave. Good night, Lucette. Good night, Rod. Moments after Rod closes the door, I hear a familiar voice whispering in my ear. Ha, <laughs> I see. Oh! I jump back in surprise and stare at him with wide eyes. Sir Mithros is leaning casually against one of the pedestals. So that is where the prince disappears to every now and then. I had no reason to care, but now I see it. If my guess is correct, he is also in league with the Lucis Bearer. When I do not answer, Sir Mithros smiles and shrugs. Well, it doesn't matter. I glance around us and notice the green shield from earlier. Once again, no one will hear this discussion. Now that the prince has confirmed your doubts, what will your next course of action be? You want to help him break his curse? Yes. Rod may have given up on breaking his curse, but I refuse to do nothing. From the way Sir Mithros is taunting me, he must know some other way to break his curse. Rod won't be happy about this, but I need to use whatever means necessary to save him. Do you know how to break his curse, Sir Mithros? Ah, 
I will assume that you have not read the full fairy tale if you do not know. Yes, princess, I know. Tell me. Mithros cocks an eyebrow and waves one finger at me. Do you not realize by now how witches work, princess? I propose a deal. I will help you, but you must help me with something in return. Help you? If you are planning on betraying the king. I have no plans of taking the crown or harming any members of the royal family. What? Then what is it you want from me? I prefer keeping you in suspense. I do enjoy surprises. You will find out the day after tomorrow. That's my... Your 18th birthday. I look at... I look at him... Per 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 I look at him perplexed. What does this have to be on my birthday? Why does it have to be on my birthday? Don't worry, your highness. What I request from you will also make for a pleasant gift. What do you say? I bite my lower lip as I reconsider. I am worried about Sir Mithros' request, but I no longer have the time. Viorca's marriage is tomorrow, and Sir Mithros has the upper hand. I understand. Good. Now remember, dear Lucette, witches are bound to their oaths. In order for the prince to regain his voice and life, something must be taken by force, just like in the fairy tale. What does he mean by that? Tell me what I must do. Oh, I did forget to mention this, but it is not you who must act, but the prince. What? If Rod could help himself, he would have already done so. Please trust me, princess. You will have my aid, and I will make sure the prince's curse is broken. Today is Viorica's wedding day, and also the day Rod is destined to die. Sir Mithros explained his plan briefly last night. He told me that he would have a valuable item delivered to Rod that he would, would need to use to break his curse. He further explained that it was something he would need to use after the wedding. I tried to question him further, but he disappeared before I could, saying that he needed to start his preparations. I don't completely trust him, but I am running out of time and I have no choice now. The royal family has left the palace to attend to Viorca's wedding. It is unusual for the king to attend another noble's wedding, but Viorca is an exception given that she is one of Rod's and Emmeline's best friends. Despite Sir Mithros' reassurance, I am still restless. Sir Mithros told me that everything would be alright, that Rod would not instantly die the moment Viorca got married. Why must his involvement be reserved for a time after the wedding? Why does he not act now? Someone looks like they're in a bad mood. Dolores suddenly stands before me smirking. Her appearance shocks me so badly I nearly drop the dishes in my hand. What impeccable, what impeccable timing. We've heard from the prince about Mithros. No wonder I was iffy about that man. I should have realized he was a witch. Do you know him? Yes, I do. Delora walks closer and places both of her hands on my shoulders. Listen to me, princess. I'm warning you. Stay away from Mithros. Do you understand? That man is a sly devil. He cannot be trusted. I take a deep breath to still my rapidly beating heartbeat. I hope I will not regret asking for his help. Princess, I need you to promise that you will stay away from Mithros. Yes, of course. Good. For the time being, I will resume my investigation. If I'm lucky, I'll find out what Mithros hopes to accomplish. Actually, he's not in the palace right now. He went to the royal family to attend a wedding. A wedding, huh? How unusual. I can only assume he must be there at the wedding to help Rod. Well, better make use of his absence while I can. I'll see you later, princess. When I am left to my own thoughts, my mind returns to the issue of Rod's curse. Sir Mithros mentioned a similarity with the fairy tale, which means I may have a chance of finding out more. Mm. 
Sir, uh, Sir Mithros mentioned a similarity with the fairy tale, which means I may have a chance of finding out more. I decide to go to the library when I have the time to pick up the book. I am now on my way back to my quarters with the book in hand when I see Rod walking toward me from the other side. His eyes are fixed on the floor, so he does not notice me as I approach. Rod! He's still alive! Does that mean Sir Mithros has succeeded? Oh, it's just you. Rod's voice still comes from Sebi. The realization instills a deep fear inside me. He's still cursed. How much time does he have left? Much to my surprise, Rod actually smiles at me. The smile is forced, however, and does not reach his eyes. He looks crestfallen. I think I chose this one. Are you alright? I've lied. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. But I'm tired of set. So for tonight, I just want to rest. Good night. Without waiting for my answer, Rod begins to walk away. A strange heaviness hangs in my chest. Why do I feel like this is the last time I will see him? I glance down at the book in my hands and slowly open up to the last page of the Little Mermaid fairy tale. Why did you do this in the first place? I start reading from the section where the mermaid sisters explain how to get her fins back. Take this knife. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the heart of the prince and you will become a mermaid again. The, bo the book falls from my hands and collapses to the floor. I stare at it, dumbfounded. Wait, this means Rod needs to kill Fiorica? Then the item that Sir Mithros mentioned earlier. Could it be the knife? I need to find him. I turn and start running in the direction of Rod's room in hopes that I will still be able to reach Sir uh in the hopes that I will still be able to catch Sir Mithros there. When I come to the end of the hallway, I however it is not Mithros who stands by Rod's door. Emmeline? Emmeline is slowly walking in the direction of the throne room. Her movements seem Oddly mechanical. Whoops. I rush toward her. M? Princess Emmeline? Where are you going? Must go to Rod. Why is she going to the throne room? Rod is back in his room. My eyes catch on something shining in Emmeline's hand. My heart nearly stops when I see the, that it's a knife. Emmeline, what are you? If he kills his beloved with this blade, his curse will break and he won't die. It's as if she's in the trance. Is this Sir Mithros is doing? Is she under one of his spells? Emmeline, step out of it! Emmeline starts walking again, ignoring me. When I try to approach her again, thinking to steal the knife away, a shadow suddenly comes to stand between us. Varg looms in front of me, smirking. Where did you come from? Let me go, Varg. No, can do, princess. Don't you want to see? Don't you want to save the prince? I... I look at Emmeline, who has not even turned to glance at us. I glare at Varg, who is still standing in my way, grinning. Step aside, Varg. Ah, feisty. You are far more interesting, princess, than your stepsister. I tried to step... So I try to sidestep Varg, but Varg follows my motions. I try again and again, but he just thwarts my progress. He holds his hands up in the air, eyes br eyebrows raised. Tell me, what will you do if you let her go? Would you stop him from? Would you stop him from killing the girl? Rod would never kill her. He would never do anything to harm the person he loves. He refused to do it, and he has no reason to do it now. What is with this music? <laughs> Varg is silent for a few moments as he reconsiders. Interesting. He steps aside and bows. Go ahead then. You are letting me go. I would like to see this play end as it may, without any strings attached.
When I push open the door, I find Rod kneeling down. Emmeline lies on the floor in front of him, unconscious. Emmeline! She's fine. She's just asleep. Something glints in Rod's hands. Even from the distance, I know it is the same knife Emmeline was holding earlier. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see someone slouched against one of the pillars. Hiroka? I rush to her side and sigh in relief when I see the gentle rise and fall of her chest. She's still alive. How? How'd she get here? It was Sir Bethos, bad. I remember Rocky back to my room after talking with you. I blacked out and when I came to, I was already here with Viorica. She had I've already checked on her. She seems to be under some kind of sleeping spell. Em just came in a, just a few moments ago. Has been the knife and simply collapsed after begging me to kill Viorica. I think Ed is under a spell as well. What? Rod glances down at the knife in his hand, his expression glassy. Ev always convinced me. She pleaded that I not leave any of them behind. It's not as if I want to die and leave my family, but... He stares at the knife for a few moments, then curses as he slams his fist into the ground. I can't kill her. Why would Sir Beethros want me to do this? Guilt floods my chest, making it difficult to breathe. I was the one who asked Sir Mithros to help Rod. He said he knew how to break his curse. But I didn't realize that in order to break his curse, he needed to kill the person he loved. I relied entirely on the story Emmeline told me. And that was my biggest mistake. I should have read the full fairy tale in the fucking first place. I would, I could never kill her. Such a shame. Sir Mithros emerges from the shadows, looking at us with disappointment. To break his curse, Prince Murad must kill his beloved with the knife his sister brought him, just like in the fairy tale. Mithros turns to Rod. And here I thought your fist. And here I thought your sister might be able to change your mind. You were, after all, supposed to do this of your own accord. I was wrong. I shouldn't have underestimated your stubbornness. Casting a spell on you would have solved this problem entirely. Why are you doing this? Well, Sir Mithros shifts his gaze to me. Rod follows his gaze to me and raises his eyebrows. There's no use lying to him now. I... Ask Sir Mithros to help me break your curse. You what? I didn't know that you were meant to kill Viorca. I... Rod shakes his head, his face marred with disappointment. Anyone who tries to help you with will inevitably make things harder for me, Lucette. I wanted to help you, Rod. I've already made my mind. If you really want to help me, then just please respect my decision. Please. Shame. And here I thought I would be witnessing a dramatic finale tonight. Sir Mithros starts to walk away. I'm about to chase after him, but then realize that there's nothing else he can do. Rod has made his decision. I feel my heart plummet as I slowly nod to Adam. So, there really is no other way. I could never break my curse like this. Fiorca was my first love. And my good friend. And besides, my love for her faded a long time ago. She's been replaced. You've been my beloved for some time already, Lucette. But it doesn't matter, does it? I will die soon. Rod! I feel a heavy weight on my chest, as if some force is crushing my heart. I'm sorry. I promised myself that I would save your life, but I failed. I blink back the tears that are bringing in my eyes. Rod stands, then moves over to stand before me. He places a hand on my cheek. You've done nothing, You've done nothing wrong, said. so don't blame yourself. What did I expect to happen? Even if Rod killed Viorca today, he would have carried that burden for the rest of his life. And all because I asked the witch to make him do something he did not want to do in the first place. Rod reaches for Sebi and places him in my hands. Once the clock strikes 12, I am going to disappear. It's really a shame I'll be disappearing on your birthday. I would It would have been nice to celebrate this one with you.
promise you'll take care of my family for me. There must be another way. You can't just go yet. I'm sorry, Lucette. I cannot even bring myself to consider what is happening. Panic engulfs my senses as I stare at Rod, who is becoming translucent. Rod, you're... If only I could be with you and everyone else just for a bit longer. Despite the fact that his words waver, when Rod looks at me with his smile... When Rod looks at me, his smile is bright and warm. My vision blurs as tears gather in my eyes. I like you, Lucette. If we had more time together, I think I would have grown to truly love you. In the next instant, his body has dissolved into soft orbs of light. The light gathers in the air, then begins to fade. I'm so sorry. Bad end! Oh, you could... You could realize, or you could probably, uh, you could probably predict what my reaction was when I got that the first time. That was my very first route, and I got a bad end. I think my reactions ranged from WTF to God damn it! And so, we will not ended there. Uh, you could see that I also got Rod's good end because I was so angry that I got the bad end that I redid the entire game to get his good end. I didn't show it on cam. I just uh, I went uh, here, picked Rod's end, then just fast forwarded all of the options. Uh, hold on, let me go back to this i went to the internet the help of the internet and a good friend who played through this entire game and then i skip this go to the next one um answer him go outside what do you mean out of my palace? Because he doesn't want to talk about his curse. Stay silent. Refuse. Give her the correct answers. I'm fine, even though I'm not. Stay with him. You're not doing a very good job. Sebi sighs. How can I how can I not when Rod is here thinking too loudly? It makes my headache. You got headaches? That's not the point. The point is that when he thinks on something too long, his head becomes cloudy and really full. Like it's going to explode. That's why I got to explain for him. He's not very good at expressing his thoughts, so I Rod cuts Sebi off by pinching his cheeks. Ow, 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 ow! Okay, okay, I'll stop talking now. Rob sighs and continues walking. Rob, have you spoken with Emmeline since that earlier incident? No. As, as much as I want to ask him about his curse, I doubt he will divulge anything right now. I decide to keep my thoughts to myself as we head to the Martian. Compliment. Who would have thought that you were actually capable of being nice? What? What was that supposed to be? Was that supposed to be a compliment? Yes, you're always so grumpy. I don't even think I have seen a genuine smile on your face before. I could say the same for you. Birds of a feather flock together then. Rod stares at me dumbfounded. I cannot help but smile at a little at his expression. Do you really like do you really dislike the fact that we are so similar? Rod is still staring at me wide-eyed. You just smiled. I I did not. Rod thinks your smile is pretty. I I do that. You two really are the same. I take a deep breath to calm the erratic beating of my heart. Anyway, I still want you to help. I still want to help you with your curse, Rod. What do you why do you refuse to break it? 
Rod stares down at his feet, expression melancholy. Because I cannot. Rod stops and shakes his head. He says nothing else and I do not probe him anymore, especially after seeing the distant look on his face. Tell him. Sure, I'm a better dancer than you. The scowl on Rod's face deepens. I almost smirk. Maybe he is reluctant to show me, but Rod is also full of pride. He's more likely to show me if I pose a challenge. You did even answer the question. And? Are you underestimating my dancing? The others may have forgotten, but you still remember, do you not? I am a princess and was taught by the kingdom's best instructor. I say the words with pride, and I notice Rod's lips twitch in response. It actually makes me feel accomplished to get under Rod's skin when he is usually the one getting under mine. Having the best instructor does not automatically make you the best dancer. I'm pretty confident with my own skills. Say what you want, but I refuse to believe you without any proof. I still say I'm a better dancer than you are. Rod steps forward and pulls me suddenly into his arms, taking me by surprise. He looks at me, clearly determined. Fine, Dad. You will have your proof. I'll make you swallow those words with this dance. We shall see. Rod starts leading the dance. He glides us with, into an imaginary rhythm of a waltz. Even without the music, I am able to count the steps in my head as I follow his lead. This is different from the short dance we showed Emmeline. Rod's movements are graceful, his touch gentle as he leads me to an underarm twirl. And my first thought to this picture was, damn, look at those eyes. He's got some sharp eyes and very silky looking hair. And I think another thought was, this is also the first time we see Sebi in a close up. When I come to face him once again, I notice the gentle way he stares at me. The usual hardness of his expression is gone, melted into something more relaxed. I find myself staring back at him, looking into his eyes. Perhaps Rod does not. Oh, perhaps Rod does have some gentleness to him. Our gaze does not break as he twirls him. You have beautiful eyes. Rod's eyes widen as mine do. He abruptly lets go of my hands and steps back. I can only stare at him, my face warm. It wasn't me this time. That was more than just a stop, I swear. Rod says nothing, though his cheeks continue to darken with embarrassment. Oh my. Rod and I turn to look at Emmeline, who is hovering by the door. Excuse me. Rod quickly walks through the doorway and out into the hallway, leaving Emmeline and I alone in the room. What just happened? That was a wonderful dance, Lisette. You were watching? I only saw the last few minutes, but you know, the two of you really did look like a couple. It was sweet. A, a couple. Oh, you're blushing. I put a hand to my cheek and turn away with a scowl. I am not. Besides, whatever just happened was embarrassing. Do you like Rod? I stare at her. I don't. Also, you are forgetting that I am a maid who could never be with the princess. Who could not be with the prince even if I wanted to. He is crumpling cold. I think the first time I read that, I, th I said he's grumpy and old. And <laughs> that made me laugh even harder. And even though we are not blood related, he is still my stepbrother. If only Rem Emmeline could realize how crazy her words in light of the truth. Emmeline suddenly looks starry eyed as she giggles at me. Love, no Love knows no boundaries, dear Lucette. Besides, he seems to like you. Your brothers hate me. Rod can be a contradiction sometimes. Sometimes he says the opposite of what he feels. It's only when you are getting to know him as well as I do that you realize what his truths are. I cannot help but think of Sebi, who always speaks Rod's thoughts aloud when they are contradictory. He, all, he, he was also. Yeah. He was always so mean to Vierica when we were young. 
He would always bully her for being a crybaby, even though he cried far more often. But then I realized he treated her more special than he did anyone else. Back then, I knew that he liked her. I thought that one day the two of them might even grow to love each other, but Emmeline lets out a long sigh as she directs her attention out of the window. His attitude toward her has changed ever since she was he was cursed. Then they grew even more distant when Bjorko find the lover. Is that the reason why you have been going to the shop? Is that the reason why you have been going to the toy shop with Prince Rod? Because you want them to bring them back together? Emily nods. The three of us were best friends. The three musketeers is not the same without Rod. I keep on asking him what's wrong, but he refuses to tell me. He's always been stubborn, but it's not like him to keep secrets. It's really frustrating because I have no idea what I should do to help him. I thought he was just being stubborn with me, but apparently no amount of prodding even from his own family will make him budge. Why is he being so st difficult? I hope you do not mind me asking, but what do you know about his curse? And then she explains. Oh, I tell him. Those wormen were insulting the queen. I thought a lecture was in order. Oh, but everyone is entitled to their own opinion. What? I narrow my eyes at him. Something like this can't be helped. Bad rumors are unavoidable. Rod looks away, his expression suddenly pained. This wouldn't have happened if I hadn't wished for. Rod never finishes the sentence. He clears his throat before looking at me. What was he trying to say? We should keep you from returning home, Fyorka. I take Lucid, I'll take Lucid back to the palace. Fyorka's eyes narrow, as she looks ready to say something, but Rod has already reached out for my hand to pull me along beside him. <sighs> my eyes narrow as I recognize the path we are on. This is not the way back to the palace. No, it isn't. We're going to the Martian. Why? Because I was on my way there before I was forced to take a detour. Because so does drug attention to herself. What? But Rod ignores me, and we walk the rest of the way to the Martian in silence. Oh, I'm supposed to not tell him. Oh well, well, hopefully it's not gonna be explain the situation. Whoops. It's okay, I think I made a mistake the last time I tried redoing this too. Tell him off for his behavior. The words spill out of me before I can even think on them. What have I done to make you angry with me? Not big. He turns away and I glare as I follow closely behind him. You expect me to believe that? You gonna at least look at me when I'm talking to you? I reach out a hand to his elbow and pull him back so that he is facing me. Rod! But the words die in my throat as I see the expression on his face. His face is red and he refuses to look me in the eye. My surprise causes me to release him. Rod quickly turns around and begins to walk away. I am left to stare dumbly after him. Something aches deep in my chest as Rod coldness. Please. Rod startles so strongly that he almost drops the placard he is holding. Please tell me. We've been partners for months now. But I barely. Yes, I know that is unusual partnership and that most of our helping each other has been so dope, but I'm only one good deed away from breaking my curse while you seem to be no closer to breaking your curse when we started. I will do whatever I can to help you with your curse, Rod. So please let me help you. Silence falls. Moments later, Rod sighs and looks away from me. Some unspeakable, sad emotion shines through his eyes. Even if I wanted your help, there's nothing you could do, Lucette. Dread settles in the pit of my stomach at Rod's words. Could I be right? Will Rod actually die if he does not manage to break his curse? Emmeline told me the story of the mermaid, of the little mermaid. She said that the mermaid died 
If the prince marries someone else. Rod, when Bjorka marries this moon, will you? My voice trails off when I hear the sound of the door behind us. Is it Ophelia or the king? Rod rushes forward and grabs me before I can glance back at the door. Ow! I become aware of the weight holding me down on the floor. The impact of the ground against my head blurs my vision, making it impossible for me to see what is happening at first. Am I underneath the dining table? I struggle to try and sit up, but the weight pushes me down again, forcing me to be still. Quiet. Rod, why did he push me underneath the table? I'm about to ask him aloud when the sound of footsteps silences me. I cannot help be I cannot help but remember what Sir Mithros was saying about rumors. If Rod and I were seen alone together by the servants, the rumors will no doubt get worse. But why is Rod doing this? I stay quiet as the people that enter the dining hall begin to talk. How strange for this place to be empty at this time of day. There is a lot there's a pause, then another voice speaks up. You have better have good news for me, Mithros. Sir Alcaster and Sir Mithros. Rod's hands tighten on my shoulders. Everything is as you requested, Sir Alcaster. There should be no issues. There better not be. You've disappointed me before, Mithros. I would be careful not to try my patience again. Y yes, Sir Alcaster. Sir Mithros sounds oddly subservient. But why? The two of them are both ranked equally. And neither of them should have to answer to anyone other than the king. Unless Sir Alcaster truly is the witch and is forcing Sir Mithros to obey him with a spell. Wait a few moments after I leave. We should not be seen together. I do not hear Sir Mithros respond, but I can hear Sir Alcaster leaving the room. Sir Mithros sighs out, but is otherwise silent when he leaves the room after a few moments. I exhale fully as the door finally closes behind Sir Mithros. This is bad. I was so engrossed in Sir Alcaster and Sir Mithros' conversation that I only now realize that Rod is hovering over me. Yay! Close up number two of Sevi! Hey, are you alright? Are you hurt? You look a little... Rod suddenly pauses as he notices our positions. He stares at me for a few moments, eyes wide. Oh. He scrambles out from beneath the dining table, and by the time I do the same thing, he is standing far away from me, his gaze fixed on the wall. He's bright red. It would be funny if I weren't sure I was the same color. Rod clears his throat. Ahead. It seems that Sir Alcaster really is the witch. If he has the ability to make Sir Bethros obey him, Lady Parfait should be told immediately. Rod turns on his heel to leave the room. Rod, wait! What? This is urgent, princess. I just can't. When Yuriko marries Desmond, will you die? Rod pauses for a moment, but I can tell from his pained expression that he will not speak. You're running at the time, Rod. My eyes flip between Sevi and Rod. What does that mean? That day. He turns away from me once again and starts walking away. Rod! There must be something in my voice that makes Rod stop because he turns to look at me. Please stop running away from this. What would you do? What would knowing the answer achieve, Lucette? Though Rod's words are though Rod's words are harsh, his tone is soft. There is nothing anyone could do. Leave it, leave it alone, Lewis said. It's for the best. I cannot help but get mad at Rod's dismissive tone. I move toward him, frowning. How could you say something like that? You are not the only one that will be affected if you keep refusing to do anything to break your curse. Can you imagine what your death would be to your sister? To your mother? Losing you would destroy them. Rod's face is suddenly inches away from mine. He places his hands on the wall behind me, caging me in. His face is flushed with anger, but the look in his eyes is tormented. Bye, Fadley has been dealing with the consequences of my actions for the majority of my life. Don't think I don't know what curse, what effect my curse has on the people closest to me. Besides, I, I don't want to involve you in this too. 
His voice is a whisper, but I can still hear his words. Rod? Rod pushes away from me and stalks off as I stare after him. He says that, but then he still does nothing to break his curse. I don't understand at all. What is stopping him? Rod is absent from the palace for the rest of the day and returns only once the sun has set to prepare for the ball. And we'll go to the next one. Poor Emily. Dot dot dot. Um, in front. Is this how you really want things to end? What are you talking about? Um, going to uh, die when Bjorko gets married tomorrow, am I right? Because there's nothing you could do. I already expect it, accepted my love. And then, kiss. I have to apologize. And how was the wedding? I quickly clamp my hand over my mouth after I ask a question. Rod just know, saw the person he loves getting married today. I already know how he feels. I apologize. I should not have asked that. Rod looks at me surprised. Then, to my shock, he starts chuckling. Why are you laughing? He, you look like a criminal caught the act of a crime. I apologize for trying to be sensitive, your highness. Without realizing, I'm smiling back at him. It looks like Rod has finally learned to converse with me normally. I hope this will not be the last time I see him smile like this. I'm tired, Lucette. I will retire for the night. Rod looks at me again and smiles. Good night, Lucette. And she reads the fairy tale. And we see Varg. Uh, Oh, okay, I think now it's different because we have the good ending. I stop in my tracks when I see Sir Mitro standing just in front of the main door to the throne room. He looks at me expectantly as I approach. Sir Mithros! Good evening. Oh, good evening, your highness. Such a lovely night tonight, isn't it? Only half an hour left before you will turn 18. Do not forget our deal, princess. Come midnight, I will be requesting your aid in exchange for helping the prince break his curse. I clench my fists. I clench my hands into tight fists. Helping the prince break his curse? Rod killing someone is not what I wanted. Sir Mithros puts a finger into his lips. Shh. You would not want to attract the attention of the knights, would you? There would be quite a bit of explaining to do then. I glare at him, then take a deep breath and lower my voice. You didn't tell me that breaking Rod's curse meant killing someone. Oh? But I am only honoring my end of the deal. Perhaps you should have done your research before agreeing. The grin on his lips never wavers, but I can see the amusement in his eyes. I relied entirely on the story Emmeline told me, and that was my biggest mistake. I should have read the full fairy tale. But now it seems you finally know the full story of the prince's fairy tale. Hmm? To break his curse, Prince Rod must kill his beloved with the knife his sister has brought him, just like in the fairy tale. Sir Mithros continues to smile at me. I realized he is speaking slowly, like one might speak to a child. So condescending. No. Wait. I start to realize Sir Mithros is purposely drawing out this conversation to stall me. I need to go. Sir Mithros does not stop me when I slide past him to open the doors to the throne room. The first thing I see when I enter the throne room is Rod. He is standing in the middle of the area with Emily in his arms. Is... is she alright? Rod gently places Emily on the throne. He leans down to look more closely at her sleeping face, then reaches down to take the object in her hand before he faces me. I keep... I can see the metallic glimmer in his hand, and I know that he is holding the knife Emmeline brought her with her. Where did she even get this knife? 
He pauses to stare at it, then suddenly turns to me, eyes widening at some sight in another part of the room. I follow his gaze to the corner of the room where Viorca floats in midair. Her eyes are closed and her hands clasped as if she is just sleeping. Viorca? But how? Such a pleasant surprise, isn't it? Sir Mithros walks into the room with his hands clasped behind his back. You. Good evening, your highness. Is this your doing? Sir Mithros just smiles at her pleasantly. Rod only glares back at him. Guards! Sir Mithros clicks his tongue and chuckles. My apologies, your highness, but no one will be able to hear you no matter how loud you shout. Not even your witch friend will hear anything through my magic. He knows the war is here. I glance around the room and notice that Sir Mithros has created his silent green barrier. This is the same magic he used yesterday. Oh. Now, let us go back to the matter at hand. You are running out of time, Prince Rod. It would be a shame to see your, you perish here after the princess went through the trouble of asking me to save your life. Lucette, what is he talking about? I... The princess didn't want you to die, so she asked me to help break your curse. Sir Mithro spreads his arm, gesturing toward Emmeline and Viorca. And so, I have been so kind enough to set the stage and gather its actors for what I hope to be a wonderful finale. I cannot help but wonder how this fairy tale will, will end. Why would you do this, Lucette? I didn't know it meant killing Viorca, I swear! That is why I came here, to stop you! I told you so many times that there is nothing that you could do to help me, and yet you still refuse to listen to me. Because I refuse to let you die! Can you not see that you're important to me, Rod? Oh my, what a scandal! Lucette, I turned to Sir Mithros and stared daggers at him. I asked you to help Rod! Why did you have to involve Emmeline in this? It was a necessary requirement that the princess be the one to give him the knife, your highness. It was, after all, the mermaid's sister that brought him the knife, brought her the knife to kill her beloved. So that's how she knew about all this. She came here crying and begging to break my curse because she didn't want me to die. I always wanted to do it. But I could never kill someone. That's why I always refuse to break my curse. But even if... Even if I really want to live. Hmm. Perhaps I miscalculated. Ah oh well, this can be remedied. Sir Mithros waves his hand. His fingers begin to glow subtly with magic. What are you? Uh, Rod! A faint green glow surrounds Rod as he doubles over. What are you doing to him? What I should have done to begin with. The witch who cursed him said he must do this of his own accord, but seeing as he refuses, I'm going to have to bend the rules slightly. Rod stands up abruptly and begins walking toward Viorca. The knife in his hand glistens behind, beneath the patches of scattered moonlight in the room. Princess, he's going to kill Viorca! Stop this, Mithros! Where's the lure?